Hey YouTubers, I am your host Tony Merkel and I want to let you know that we are a podcast first which means we upload our shows to YouTube. If you really like the show and you want to hear it on the go whether you're at the gym or in the car driving around go to iTunes and hit subscribe. And if you're not on iTunes, no problem. Go to iHeartRadio, Spotify or your favorite podcast player hit subscribe and you can listen to us that way as well. So I hope you guys enjoy the show. Let's get to it. This was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. Well, the giant moves. He's got a spear in one hand and he's running really fast and spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody yells, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blow his head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling it. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reached my hand into this bush and I touched air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. Welcome to the show, everybody. You're listening to The Confessionals. I am your host, Tony Merkel. Thank you for being here. If you've had an encounter or a story you'd like to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is theconfessionalspodcast at gmail.com. That's theconfessionalspodcast at gmail.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com. Hit the contact section and you can reach me that way as well. Either way works for me. Just get a hold of me. Now, last week, I announced that we are doing memberships on the website. So if you go to theconfessionalspodcast.com, you will see that there is a join button. And if you hit that join button, you have two options to sign up as a member. The first option is $7 a month. And the second option is $70 a year, which you get two months free if you sign up for that option. What will you get as a member? You'll get one extra episode every Thursday. Every week, you're going to get one extra episode on Thursdays. Plus, you get access to forums, chat rooms, instant messenger, private messenger. You get to listen to Patreon archives. There's some audio I was able to salvage from those days. And you also get access to watching live shows once a month or once every other month. I'll be doing a live show with a guest on the show and there will be a live call in number so members can call in and ask questions and join in on the conversation. If that sounds interesting to you, go to the confessionalspodcast.com and join the membership program today. Now, this week, we have Carrie coming on the show, and it is a great episode. Now, Carrie, her and her husband actually bought a piece of property on a national forest. It was the only piece of private property on the national forest, and it just so happens that it was on top of a deep underground military base. She talks about seeing chimeras, upright walking dogs, black-eyed children, helicopters going into portals. There was a lot of things going on on this property, and she comes on the show to talk about it all. This is one of those episodes episodes, you're going to want to sit tight and listen to every word Carrie says. But before we get into that, I want you to listen to the trailer for this week's member episode. It's a good one. We talk about a lot of things, including Bigfoot. Let's go. I was 13 years old, and I had a, um, a little motorcycle. I had a 100 KE Kawasaki, and every once in a while, I would take my motorcycle, and I would just 
take a ride alongside the river and go in the back because it was just a nice little spot that I could just kind of mosey on down behind the house and just cross some railroad tracks and go to the river. And, and um, it was right around that area. I was coming around and I come across, you know, go around a little bend under the river and I see this uh, dark, I wouldn't say, it, it looked like a man. And he was standing, he was tall, uh, probably six, seven foot tall. And I knew, as soon as I saw it, the hair stood up on my arms and then all over my body. And I knew this thing was not a bear. So, um, I stopped the motorcycle and I was probably, oh geez, no more than... 75 yards to max so I could barely see eyes but this thing it was he was just standing there and and it was probably a good five or six seconds and then as soon as he walked down the bank he he disappeared like he walked down and down the bank and disappeared there was nothing. (laughs) Carrie, how are you? I'm just fine. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming on the show and contacting the show with your experiences. Now, we were just talking before we started recording, and you started sharing uh, some things about, I guess, your husband that you were married to and uh, some of his clearances. So if you want, you can just start us off right there with some of your experiences with that. Okay, I'm going to start out with acquiring the property first, and then I can get back in and make references. Um, first of all, I'm going to say that before, Before I get to the point of the deep underground military bases, I want to say that for 27 years uh, that I was with my ex-husband, I was aware that he had very high security clearances because he did so many Department of Defense contracts. And there were things like... um, he w- we would drive down the road and he would see something on a truck and he would say, I manufacture all of those for that corporation. Or we flew constantly. At one point, we were very wealthy and we traveled constantly. I'd be sitting in an airliner and it didn't matter if it was LL, Continental, Southwest or whatever it was. He would point to the um, rubber fittings around the windows and he'd say, I made those for such and such an airline and I make those for such and such like Boeing or or lead Lockheed or somebody like that on their fighter jets or whatever. He was always telling me I make these parts. And so I was aware that he had a high security clearance, but until the last year, I did not know just how deep it was. And that's when it got scary. So I will be bringing some of this up as I go, because what I did was I made notes so that I could keep things in chronological order, because if you don't go in a direct order and people are listening to you, they get confused what we're talking about. And my aim is everybody needs to know what every government in the world is involved in and how dark and deep and sinister all of them are, including our own nation. And I will not throw our president on that pile. I refuse to do that. He inherited this. Okay, so what I want to do is start out with in the early spring of 2015, um, my sweetheart, and I call him sweetheart because I'm protecting his name and the location of the property. Because um, for several years, I have been harassed with, uh, they, they tap our phone lines. When I start talking to someone about something they don't like me to tell, they will either completely cut the call off or they'll make it impossible for one of us to hear the other. And that might happen while I'm doing this phone call. So at any way, I, I'm going to call my, my man, sweetheart. So in um, early 2015, we had been living in his home um, 
in a small village in the Southwest and um, discovered a property that was for sale. And this property is extremely remote wilderness inside of a national forest, um, a million acres plus, and we're the only ones there. So naturally, the property is completely off grid. And it is so remote, particularly six months of the year when some of the passages are covered with snow, there is no law enforcement. If if we were to have an accident, one of us would have to leave the other, dry, open the gate, drive through, go up to the top of the crest to pick up a cell phone tower connection from the next state over and call. And that doesn't mean we're going to get help within two hours or less, especially, and there will be no help in the winter. Uh, so the same goes not only for ambulance or fire or anything else, but it goes for law enforcement. So um, what happened was, uh, as soon as we took possession of the property, we had discussions with the United States Forest Service Law Enforcement, the BLM, that's Bureau of Land Management, uh, the County Sheriff, the State Police, which is also a part of Homeland Security, as well as the state game and fish. And they actually said that we are the law to the point that every one of the five agencies told us, if you have to do something lethal, you have to do it because you're on your own out there. Call us afterwards and we'll take care of it. So there just isn't any way for calling for help. So I want everybody to understand this is how remote we are. Um, a lot of people have seen um, the Mountain Man shows on television. Well, we don't live as poor. <laughs> We're not that poor and the home isn't that bad by any means. It's paradise. But that's how remote it is. Uh, you can't even make a phone call without driving up the top of the hill. So anyway, during that time while he was preparing his property, I was staying in the house at a, at a little village about 25 miles east. And um, Sweetheart had converted his van into a nice little camper, and he and the big dog would spend three or four days at a time inside a barn that existed on the property when he bought it, but it had no barn doors on it. It was wide open to the weather. And um, as he would sleep in his van, he began being troubled by a very low frequency hum that nobody else was able to hear. Uh, but this hum was very loud. And it was so painful to him that there were times when I would see him grab the sides of his head and scream, face all contorted and run out of the house. It was that painful. But later, we found out that his best friend living in the village was also hearing it. Now, these two men, it would go on all night. They, would they were beginning to have troubles sleeping. Their health was beginning to be affected. And eventually, by the end of the year, Sweetheart lost the hearing in one ear. So when this was going on, I started researching what this dang hum was. And I remembered that many decades ago, I was starting to hear little bits and pieces that people from out of state were retiring in the Santa Fe and Taos areas. And they were complaining of this humming sound that was keeping them awake and actually giving them chronic diseases. And every time any of them would go, to a physician, there was no functional reason, and eventually they would tell the people what's well, in your head. Well, they, they hit the nail on the head because it was in their heads. They were hearing it. And so a lot of them uh, had to leave and go back to another state somewhere. But today, if you can hear that hum, and I will soon tell you what that humming is, it doesn't matter what state you live in, darling. If you can hear it, you're going to hear it, and it's going to destroy your health probably going to cost you, you your hearing. So anyway, what I found out was um, that sweetheart, his problem, the property is directly above a dumb, D-U-M-B, but not dumb like you can't speak, 
or that you're not intelligent. DUM is the acronym for Deep Underground Military Base. They are all over the world. They are even under the ocean. All of them are connected by elaborate tunnels. And I'll get to that verification for you later. I am not whistling Dixie. Okay, what this hum is, is electromagnetism. They, these tunnels are filled with enormous monorails. And the vehicles that ride those monorails move faster than the speed of sound. Today, we only know that jet airplanes can do that. But they do this underground. And it's how they transport train loads of airplanes, tanks, helicopters, war equipment of every kind. And nobody sees it moving around. And moving faster than speed of sound doesn't take long to cover one whole state and move from one military base to another within the state or over the state line. So anyway, it was the throbbing from this magnetic monorail that was destroying his hearing. So um, this property is in one direction, 13 miles from the nearest paved road, in another direction, 15 miles, and in another direction, I'm going to say right at 30. There's three egress. And depending upon the weather, it's a crapshoot. Which one do you take and not kill yourself? And uh, so anyway, these roads are dirt. They are one lane wide. They get maintained by the Forest Service once a year and not very well at that. So you can imagine uh, torrential rainstorms, not to mention snow melt off. These roads are in terrible condition at the best time of the year. Uh, one lane, and they'll usually have a bar ditch on one side and a huge drop off on the other. And uh, in the 1930s, just a few years beyond becoming a state, a division of the United States Forest Service had put in some bridges where a small river runs winding through the mountains. And these bridges are one lane wide concrete and on each side they have like a little curb and that's it and they're not very sophisticated and even driving my big old pickup truck across there I slow down so anyway one day sweetheart was coming to the mountain property from the south side because the north entrance was still blocked by five feet of snow uh he could tell from the condition of the dirt road that someone was ahead of him driving an 18 wheeler and because of the tightness of the turns and the length of an 18-wheeler, and obviously was extremely heavy, it was destroying the bar ditches and damaging the one-lane bridges. And uh, he was getting madder and madder because uh, when you live that remotely, this is your this is your connection to life in the case of an accident. So finally, he came around a corner. Uh, it was an ex unusually tight hairpin turn. It was blocked by an 18-wheeler carrying a low boy, to to and it was uh, towing enormous tunnel trusses. And that's how he got stuck, because as the front end of his truck went around the far edge of the hair hairpin turn, by the time the rear wheels of this very long low bike caught boy caught up with him, what happened was the load in between spanned that hairpin turn and hung up on the forest trees. And so there he was, high and dry. And um, Sweetheart is a retired builder. Uh, he's built everything from 10,000 square foot mansions to one room cabins. And <clears throat> so he recognized what he was seeing. And he knew immediately it was for the military base underground because they had to leave the paved highway and come in on a single lane dirt road to access the tunnel portal. That's very important. Well, he had to turn around 
because he, there was no way of getting past this, and it's, it was not going to be disappearing in a day. So I had to turn around and drive all the way back to where he came from, drive into Arizona, and then come in on the Arizona side. And that took hours and hours and another fill of the tank. So a few days later, I was visiting the county manager, and I asked her about all of that damage. She had not been allowed to know who that truck was or what it was. She never saw it. She only knew that she had to call in super cranes to come in from each state on opposite sides and meet. Now, Sweetheart knew that these were tunnel trusses far too large for any mining operation. We knew where they were going. They were going to go into a portal somewhere in the side of the mountain to get down in underground. And there are other things that I can tie to those portals as I go on. So anyway, the county had to rebuild all of the damages and build the U.S. Forest Service. And as, I don't even know if the U.S. Forest Service knew that those trucks were coming in. Well, a few weeks later, uh, a rancher who has cattle on the easements in this forest told my sweetheart that he had seen those same trucks and they were carrying giant mono rails. This rancher knows about the dumb. So one of them saw the tunnel trusses, one of them saw the mono rails. They were military grade, military size, and there is no way these trucks would dare transport such things on a single lane dirt road inside a national forest unless this was the only way to get building materials into the tunnel. Uh, first, my sweetheart was camping in this converted van that he had parked inside the barn that had already been on the property. It's a huge, enormous metal barn, but they never finished putting the people door on the back or the huge barn doors on the front. So the wind was whistling and it was getting really, really cold. And uh, his plan was to build a 500 square foot home in the top of the barn. And so, and this is very, very important, this fact here. It will come up later. So don't forget about what I'm about to tell you. We both had been sweeping fecal matter from every kind of rodent and bats that he had been collecting for 20 years. Neither of us wore a mask. Well, my sweetheart would stay on the property for three or four days, and then he would come home for a couple. And so I would prepare lots and lots of food for both of us to eat and then he would have enough to eat for the next three or four days while he was away we both ate the same food and he never ate anything anywhere else now the fact that we ate the same food and both were exposed to the same rodent and bat feces is very very important to what i'm going to tell you pretty soon so when he first arrived on the property and he was sleeping in his van inside the barn, he began to notice a scratching sound on the barn at night. And both of us had spent so many decades in the forest that we knew it wasn't raccoons or anything else like that. We just kind of knew, you know, sometimes our Father in Heaven puts things in our heads and we supernaturally know things we cannot otherwise know. And we knew this was very, very sinister. Um, it was malevolent, to say the least. It, it was creepy. Anyway, it began to be too cold in the barn, so I pulled my 25-foot camper up there on the property for him, and he attached it to an existing septic tank and attached a hose to an existing water well, and then he put up my generator. So now he had a nice bedroom and kitchen to live with. But when he moved into that trailer, the scratching followed him. And it began to be more and more sinister with passing time. He was also aware that huge military helicopters and Ospreys were flying extremely low over him and then literally disappearing immediately. When a plane or a helo is turning off, for instance, a helicopter, they'll turn off the engine and you'll hear the engine winding down, whether it's a jet propelled helicopter or not, you'll hear the engine winding down. And as the blades are slowing, you will hear the whoop, 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 whoop. 
It is the same thing with any turboprop, which an Osprey is, or any fighter jet. When they turn off the engines, they spin their way down. So what was happening is they would come in low, and then suddenly you didn't hear a sound. They were not crashing, and they were not landing and shutting off. It was very, very important. They came in under full power, and the sound would be immediately gone. When they left, it was suddenly they were at full power and left. So what we realized is that there is a portal to this military base very, very close to the house. We think we know where it is, and I'm not going to say because that would give away the location of where the property is, and we need the privacy, need protection. Okay, let me back up on this scratching sound. Many years ago, our listeners will probably have heard of all these things where a rancher comes out in the middle of the night and every single one of his cows or goats or sheep or whatever is laying on the ground dead with no evidence of a mortal injury and there's not a drop of blood in them. Not a drop of blood in them, but oftentimes the genitalia is removed from them. And I'll go into that later if I don't forget. Please make a note of it and remind me. So for years, they wondered if these were alien abductions and yada, yada, yada. So anyway, they're very closely um, associated with black-eyed kids. And the anagram for that is B-E-K. So if you ever see the anagram B-E-K, it means black-eyed kids. And what you can do is you can Google black-eyed kids of Dulce, that is D as in David, U-L-C, like cat, E, and it's in New Mexico. It's right smack on the Colorado border and not very, very far from Los Alamos where they created the atomic bomb and do many, many sinister things because my husband with a clearance took me there and what those guys were saying to me scared me. I, I said, don't ever bring me back here again. The BEKs are actually demons, so they can come from one dimension into another. When these demons come into our dimension deliberately to show themselves to us, they look like a child between the ages of 8 and 12. And generally, but not always, they're wearing hoodies pulled way down over their faces, and they keep their faces down. And generally, but not always, they come in the nighttime. And what they'll do is they'll scratch on the side of your house and they'll make the sound of an injured child. And sometimes they'll actually actually cry like a baby because they want you to open the door. Because if you do, they're going to kill you. Because they're demons, they don't have quite the same way of, of uh, formulating thoughts the way a human language does. So they'll, they'll ring your doorbell. And instead of saying, I'm hungry, can you feed me? They will say, is it food time? Or they'll say, I desperately need you to use your telephone. We had an accident. The reason why these demons present themselves as children is because you think of children as being innocent, can't do you any harm. This is their guise. If you open the door to them, they're going to kill you. And they are a part of this animal mutilation thing. So anyway, we discovered that that was what he was hearing, the scratching sound. Um, In November, he'd been on the property about seven months. And at that time, I bought a small car to get really great mileage. And so I decided to visit my daughter who lives in San Diego. So I prepared enough food for my sweetheart to last the length of my trip, and I took off. Now, I need to add at this point, and this is going back to us sharing food, going back to us both knee-deep in rodent crap without masks, okay? So for several months, he had been losing a lot of weight. This man is six feet tall. He got down to 145 pounds, and he looked like that cow in Auschwitz. And I kept telling him, you have parasites. At this time, I thought that it was the parasites from the barn. 
And I was struggling to figure out how come he got them and I didn't. So at any rate, I had only been in California about three, day, three days or so. He did. He called me and said that he was critically ill and I needed to get home and I needed to get home now. And he told me that the South Passage and the West Passage were covered in ice and snow. The North Passage was blocked, completely blocked. He said he was going to try and get out and get home, but he was afraid to do so because of the condition of the roads. So anyway, I went racing across the country, and when I got there, he was ashen, and he could barely get up and walk. Um, And he told me that he had nearly died three times trying to get off the mountain in the snow. But unfortunately, he was not ready to see a doctor. So this told me he's in shock. He's he's really in trouble. Parasites can and will kill you. And he's now getting to the point where he was so desperate to get home that he took the trip under extremely dangerous road conditions. Now he's home and he doesn't want to go to the doctor. So that tells me he's in shock. He's hours away from something terrible happening. So I didn't argue with him. Um, but about one o'clock, I awoke in great alarm. And he wasn't in the bed. Well, he had made it to the sofa, and he was just barely able to whisper to me that, yeah, he was ready to go to the hospital. The nearest semblance of a hospital is in Arizona, 65 miles away. And it's, it's got one doctor who refuses to be on call on weekends. One doctor and will not be on call. So anyway... I got him in my little new little car, and it doesn't have rack and pinion steering, but it has something very close to that, and I would have killed both of us if it hadn't. I made the entire 65 miles through mountains with severe turns and climbs and descents, and I was going 60 to 65 miles an hour the entire way. I was literally crossing to the left side of the road on those turns. My, my father used to be a race car driver. He called that straightening out the curves, and that's just what I was doing. Shifting gears, plowing through there like I was driving a Maserati. Um, and the whole time I was praying that there would be no elk or deer on the road because when they are at night, they're in a whole herd. You don't, oh my goodness, you don't want to do that. So when we arrived at the ER, we were the only people there. It was about 2 o'clock in the morning, so the staff was not busy. Um, And immediately, I told them that he was dying of parasites, and they needed to treat him immediately. Let me tell you something. It doesn't matter how critically ill a person is. They go to the hospital. The first first thing the doctor does is check your meds and and, and check you for toxicity like an overdose of drugs or an overdose of your medication or somebody poisoned you do not tell them i have parasites or they'll treat you like you're crazy and they won't treat you so anyway they they just fussed around and wasted a tremendous amount of time and they the nurse the head nurse was very impatient with me because i was answering all of sweetheart's questions and finally she said mr blank blank would you please tell me how you're feeling? And I said, would you look at him? He can't even hold his eyes open and he can't talk above a whisper and he can barely do that. The man is gravely ill. She wouldn't listen to me. Finally, uh, he needed to go to the bathroom and so they wheelchaired him in there. And when he came out, he had to hold on to the wall to get back into the wheelchair. And they still didn't check the bathroom to see what he passed. I mean, they just know this woman's nuts. So anyway, it took about a half an hour or so before somebody did something. And finally, a young nurse collected the pan that was underneath the toilet seat. And when she brought it on in and showed it to the head nurse, I saw the horror on the faces looking at each other. And then they turned to look at me like, oh, my God, she's right. But when they saw me looking at them, they turned back around. And that little nurse raced that thing off to the laboratory so fast. So anyway, about 20 minutes later, a paramedic came and told us he would be dead by morning. Now, mind you, this is about 2.30 in the morning. Because you'll be dead by morning if you don't check in and let us treat you. Well, there was no way I was going to let anything else happen. So there still was no doctor in the entire place. 
This paramedic did it all by himself. He's not even allowed to call the one doctor at home. So by now they're taking me very seriously and the whole tenor of the room changed. And the head nurse was attaching two large bags to his existing IV drip. And I asked her what it was. She said it was, get this, Cipro and Flagyl. She told me they were both the hottest drugs legal for humans. They were going to give it in the hottest doses legal for a human without killing him and the fastest drip legal for a human without killing him. So suddenly the staff knew that they had a dying man on their hands. Now remember, I had eaten everything he had eaten and I wasn't infested. We both were in the same rodent crap and I was not infested. So that's the reason why I brought that point up earlier. So right now I am immediately, immediately knowing this is a deliberate poisoning. So days later, when I checked him out of the clinic, he told me that he had lost most of his vision. And this is what's scary. He was feeling extremely homicidal. And with his teeth clenched, He said, get me out of here before I kill the entire staff and everybody outside the hospital. So I got him dressed and we got to the pharmacy to refill more of the same drugs. So I asked the pharmacist about the vision and the homicidal symptoms. He acted shocked, left us for a moment. He returned and claimed he had checked with other pharmacies and he had claimed he had checked the internet and found no such symptoms for those drugs. So we went ahead and filled the prescription. And when we came home, we called my sister, who is a retired nurse. Without a moment of hesitation, this nurse, without a moment of hesitation, without getting into the internet, she said, yes. Those homicidal and vision symptoms are associated with Cipro and Flagyl. So now we had to debate whether to chance death from a return of the parasites from not taking these drugs or him killing me and then going on a rampage. And so my sweetheart chose to take the rest of the drugs and then warned me to watch him very carefully that he might not kill me and then go outside and start killing the people in the village. It was that bad. So we know that this was no ordinary parasite. This, is a, this was a parasite that someone gave him that had nothing to do with what was in the barn or anything that we were eating. This, this was an attempted murder. So anyway, after knowing this was a, a military hit job, I asked him if he had ever locked up the camper when he left the property. By this time, we both knew that the military, we had known for these several months that the military was listening to every word we spoke and watching us at night. And they do it with military grade infrared and special microphones. They were, they watched everything. They listened to every word we spoke on the cell phones too. So anyway. He said that whenever he would leave the mountain, he'd lock up the camper and the gate to the property. But if he was only going hiking with the dog, he would leave the van on the property and just lock the gate and leave the camper unlocked. So I knew for sure that they had tried to kill him. There was no doubt about it. They entered the camper and poisoned the food, and he was still being plagued by the scratching on the sides of the camper at night, the black-eyed kids. And by this time, we knew what they were. So a few weeks later, he had an appointment with the VA, and so he went in there and reported what had happened. And if they wanted the transcripts from the hospital, they could get them, etc. But... During this time, we had applied for a written record of the hospital record because we wanted to know what kind of parasite that was. Because if they didn't list a parasite that comes from rodents and bats, we were going to have it. So we looked at it very carefully. Now, here is something that an FBI investigator 
or good cop, those kinds of people, they'll tell you it's not what is said or written, it's what is not. And on this lab report, it said that the problem was parasites. But when it says what type, it was blank. It did not say undiagnosed or unknown. It was blank. That's very, very critical in a medical report. So anyway, um, let's see if I can find out where my notes were. So we asked the, the doctor at the VA to contact the hospital and find out what parasite it was so that he and I could both avoid it in the future. It didn't take very long for the uh, doctor at the VA to give us the, the report was, and I'm quoting, scrubbed. It stated that he had parasites, but did not show what kind. And this is not what a report should state. It's what it does not state that is, tell, is, that is telltale. So instead of saying parasite, type unknown, it said parasite, and the next space was blank. Even the doctor at the military knew that is a foreign parasite that was put into his food when he left. They knew it. The VA knew they were dealing with a biological weapon, which means that a military officer from that base underneath the property went to that hospital and cleaned that record. So shortly afterward, he had finished the stairs in the barn up to the second floor and had a very basic rough in for the living room and kitchen area. The area that was to be the bedroom was still open to the barn down below. It was, it was still pretty rough. But I gave him an old sofa to sleep on because keeping a camper warm in snowy weather is just almost impossible. So he moved um, into the little place in the barn where he had a wood-burning stove and could keep warm. So as soon as he moved in, uh, I need to say that the living area faces to the east across to the edge of the property. And at exactly the edge of the property all the way around the trees are about 80 feet tall, and they are so close together that you might see movement in between the trees and the daylight and you'll know there's an animal back there, but you won't know if it's a deer, an elk, a wolf, a bear, you don't, because the trees are so thick you cannot see. But once you are past that barbed wire barrier in broad daylight, you must be wearing boots that come above your ankle and give you support. And when you walk, you're aware of the ground in front of your feet. You'll break your neck if you don't. Okay, so imagine being there in the dark. So anyway, what happened was uh, the windows were not yet installed, but he did put in a glass door there so he could step out onto the balcony and get some sunlight and fresh air. So as soon as he moved into the barn, and by the way, the black eyed kids are still coming around, um, beyond the fence, that's very steep, very rocky. Um, so what happened was the way we knew that there were military men coming in at night and watching and was he'd see a dozen or more tiny, tiny little beams of light, like a small flashlight that you would shine on the ground to watch where your feet are. And they'd come on for a moment and then go off and then come on for it. So obviously there was a bunch of military men in those trees watching where they were walking. You'll never see a hunting party that large. So he would see them. Um, around and this went on some for some time. One night he was awakened around two o'clock in the morning. There was a brilliant light flooding his room, and it was far more brilliant than an overhead light. It was absolutely blinding. And he stepped out onto the deck and tried to shield his face because this light was a military laser. You can't even look even in the direction; it'll blind you. And he's an ex-Marine, so he knew what they were doing. They, they were harassing him badly. So he just stepped out there and hollered and cursed, and guess what? They turned the laser off. 
The next night, they did the same darn thing. And this time, he shielded his face once again, and he fired a twenty-two pistol and started cursing them. They turned the light off immediately. And for some reason, they never pulled that tactic on him again. Well, several months, months went by, and the apartment was finished and furnished. The septic tank and the water well uh, had all been hooked up, but he was still running on a generator. And so uh, I went and stayed with him for a few days. But he had, in the meantime, installed a satellite TV and was running that from a generator. So one warm evening, he told me he was afraid to go outside and turn it off. And I looked at him, and the hair was standing up on his arms, and he was rubbing himself like he was cold. And I knew, oh, my goodness, my mountain lion, my mountain man is afraid. This is absolutely unreal. And he hemmed and hawed and hemmed and hawed. And finally he says, I'm sleepy. I got to go to bed, and I got to go down there and turn on that generator. And he said, um, he said, I'm scared to go down there. Uh, we were afraid of the dark very much. By this time, we knew there was bad stuff out there and that all of it was coming from the dome. So he asked if I would step out on the deck while he went downstairs and outside of the barn to turn off the generator. And I told him, uh, I would not be able to see you around the corner. And the time it will take me to run through the apartment and down the stairs and out of the barn, I can't help you. He says, that's okay. I just want you to be able to hear me if I scream. And then you can lock yourself in the barn. Well, he did go down and he was fine. But I didn't tell him that I had heard the scratching before the sun went down. It was the first time I had personally experienced BEKs. So anyway, he came in and we hit the bed right away and he was sound asleep while I was just kind of still snuggling in into the covers. And this is where a statement of faith comes in. We worship the only true and living God and his son. And as a Jewish woman, I call both of them by their Hebrew names. Now, I don't mess around with darkness. May I, I will get in the face of darkness. So anyway, uh, he came in and he hit the bed right away. He was sound asleep right away while I was still settling in. The scratching started up again. I was about to sit up in bed and call on the name of Yahuwah the name of the true and living God of the Bible. As soon as the thought came into my head, curse those demons and send them away, Yahuwah spoke in my head and told me very loudly and very sternly, don't move a muscle. They have military thermal vision trained on you and will see you if you just move your hand. They also have high-powered listening devices and will hear your prayer. At that, he instantly quieted the scratching and put me into a deep sleep. The next morning, I awake at five, awoke at 5.30 in the morning and had to awaken my sweetheart and tell him what happened. I need to tell you that since Yahuwah came in and did whatever he did, the scratching has never returned to that property. And the military men are no longer harassing with laser lights. But I don't have any reason to believe that they're not still watching and listening. So that same morning after we had had our coffee, and by this time all of the windows were on that one side of the room, I stepped out onto the deck into the morning sun and like a very good Jewish woman, I spread out my arms, palms up to heaven, and I pushed out my chest. And in my most loud and stern voice, I hollered, we worship the only living and true God of every universe whose name is Yahweh. You can kill our bodies, but we will be resurrected in the kingdom and he will send all of you to the lake of fire. 
to what we know, they're not coming around. They're still listening, I'm sure, but they're not coming around. I know they're listening because if I speak about these things, they tap my phone and cut off. So it's it's got to be the hand of God that you're still talking with me. Are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. But in the beginning of the episode, I started hearing some clicking. And probably about 20 minutes in, I've been hearing consistent clicking. And so I'm not sure if that's them tapping the phones or not. But That is it. That is it. That is it. Let me interring my interview just for a moment. Please okay. bear with me. All right. Tony has heard you. Military people, I know where you are. You're not far from my base. You're at another underground base right here in Utah. I know, Tony knows, that you're listening to us and you're not liking this. And I've told you and told you and told you before, there are people all over the world who already know what I'm talking about. We know you're listening, so just get the dad gum off my phone line, okay? I'm a senior citizen woman, and you can come here and shoot me if you want to, but I will be resurrected when the living God sends his son again. So just give it up. Get off the line. Okay, that usually works. Okay. Well, anyway, as time went by, we were keenly aware of the listening on our cell phones when we were inside the barn or outside. It didn't matter. But we were we supernaturally knew that they were using military devices to watch and listen. They also are very perverted in knowing what happens when our lights turn out. They watch. And there are times when I am aware you are in a peep show. So after my sweetheart finished the apartment, we were still living uh, not totally off grid because we were on a generator. So anyway, he hired a young man to come in for a couple of days to help him put the large solar panels on the roof uh, because the roof on the barn is so high and the panels are so heavy. He needs somebody big and husky to hand them up to him. So at the end of the first day, Eric told sweetheart that he was going to go for a walk while dinner was being cooked. Um, sweetheart should have remembered to tell Eric, do not leave the property, but he forgot. And Eric did just exactly that. So he realized it was getting dark and he was going to get lost. But he could see a tiny light and he could hear the generator. And so he headed for it. Now, it was late spring. All the snow had melted except what was under the trees. And it would melt a little bit in the day and then freeze at night. So it was now ice crystals. And it crunched when you walked over it. So as Eric was approaching the fence line in the dark, he heard crunching sound behind him, and he thought it was Doodle, his little white dog. But just about that time, he saw Doodle scurry underneath the barbed wire fence. Eric had been raised in that forest on his father's logging truck, so it's basically home to him as a child. Eric wears a forty-five pistol on his chest, and he is a fast, draw, sharp shooter. When he saw Doodles scoot under the fence. He turned and rapidly drew and fired point blank about 25 feet into the chest of a seven foot plus bipedal black wolf with a face more human than wolf. He emptied the weapon and that sucker did not die. Eric has no memory of going through the fence or crossing the yard. And when he got in, he was pretty badly shaken. Uh, sweetheart told me that all night long, Eric paced the room in the dark, smoke, chain smoking and muttering and mumbling about the wolf and the monster. So anyway, um, a couple of weeks later, Sweetheart had some business with another friend who is Eric's best friend. And that man told Sweetheart that Eric had been at his house for two weeks. Crying, stammering, muttering, pacing, chain smoking, and talking incoherently about a wolf monster. That was our first encounter with a chimera. Now, there is a friend who lives near the Texas border 
who has spent every summer for the last 25 years in a very large cave right beyond the land. And the trail down to that cage is a mile, and it is extremely treacherous. It never gets maintained. And when you go down it, you go down slowly and cautiously. Coming up is exhausting. It's really rough, and it's important to remember that for what I'm about to tell you. Shortly after this wolf affair, Ben was at the fence with another friend of his throwing things into his vehicle. And they were ashen in color and very badly shaken. And out of the ordinary, Ben did not stay in visit. He, he wasn't going to stay around. He was on his way out of the forest. We didn't hear from Ben for most of the rest of the year. And so we kind of figured that he had run into the military in the forest and was basically running for his life. Um, so now we, we really knew we were living with some bad stuff. Uh, fearing for his life for him. So we kind of feared because we didn't hear from him. He didn't come for the rest of the summer. We feared that the military had traced him down and killed him to keep him shut up. Well, eventually the next year, Ben did show up and visited. And he said that moments before he had come up to our fence and had been seen, he had literally come face to face with an eight foot tall white gorilla whose face was more human than an ape and the white hair was very thin with more skin showing through. Ben was so shocked at looking up from his boots and there it was in his face. He actually asked the thing, can I help you? But all he wanted to do was get away from it. And as I said earlier, the trail is extremely rough. You don't back up on that trail. You Turn around and watch where you're putting your foot or you will fall to the bottom and kill yourself. So he was checking the ground behind his boots because of that. And when he looked up, it had either climbed a tree or hidden behind one. Ben and his friend ran as fast as they could up the trail and they escaped. So that's number two chimera right near the house. So going back in time to the spring of 2015, before the construction began, I walked the perimeter of the property and I staked it for Yahuwah and Yahshua, his son, just as Yahuwah had told Abraham to walk the land of Israel and stake it for him. So about a year later, after me doing that, sweetheart, during the day, had been in several visions in one day. He said Yahuwah would jerk him out of whatever he was doing and give him some vivid vision that would just shake him to the core and then return him to his work in the barn. And an hour later, the same thing, he had about seven visions in one day. And um, one of those visions was a very brilliant blue flame that covered his land about three or four inches high sweeping rapidly from the west to the east, and I have to mind you, to the east is Jerusalem, and then it stopped. And when it was gone, it had consumed absolutely nothing. So from Bible scripture, I know this was Yahweh's sanctification and returning a blessing from the staking out that I did earlier. On the same day, one of those visions that he was given was thousands and thousands of chimeras of varying kinds lined up against the fence trying to get to my sweetheart, but they were unable to resist the unresistible force of the Holy Spirit. So we know that as long as we are on that land, those chimeras can't touch us, but they have come literally to the fence. So. He has also seen two other chimeras during this period of time. Once when he was driving back to the house to see me, one of them ran in the road in front of him. The back portion of it was an elk with a typical white butt. At midsection, it became a deer, very easily identifiable as a deer with a deer rack, and it ran faster than any animal on the mountain, faster than a deer or an elk, and was out of sight before. Sweetheart could even take stop the truck and look at it. He was stunned 
This was not a natural animal. This was something created. Another time he was leaving the mountain and a flock of wild turkeys crossed the dirt road in front of him. And as you know, turkeys move pretty doggone slowly and you can just stop and watch them. You can even talk to them. They just take their time. So he got a really good look at one of the toms. This tom had a neck three feet long with the head of a snake. And it was fully accepted by the rest of the flock of turkeys. So it seems that the military has stopped harassing us for the time being. Are you still hearing that clicking? Uh, A little bit, but it's not as consistent. Every once in a while it comes in and then goes out. Okay. That means the Holy Spirit's answering me. Um, So uh, the military appears to have stopped harassing us above land. And the scratchers, which are the black-eyed kids, have not come back since the almighty living God dispatched them. But we do still experience the planes and helos and the magnetic humming. And um, one day last year, Sweetheart was burning weeds. Oh, I almost forgot. He um, probably last summer sometime, he he had gone out about 7.30 in the morning and was standing out on the deck, which is 16 feet above the ground. And the view, the the property is like paradise in the middle of the forest. It's the most god-awful, beautiful thing you ever did see. And so he was out there on the deck admiring the view, and he got this creepy, creepy feeling he was being watched. So he started looking through the trees. Now, mind you, he's 25 feet from the fence started looking through the trees and there is a white Draco watching him. What people call the little tiny people, the little aliens with the big heads and the weird looking eyes, that, that is not an alien. Those are demons. The one world order wants you to think that they're friendly aliens from outer space, but they're not. They're from this, they're from terra firma. They are demons and they come and go from different dimensions. Those are called Dracos. They have white, gray, um, brownish, and I think green. I think there are four colors of Dracos. Anyway, he saw this thing on the fence, 25 feet from him. Scared the big jabers out of him. He ran in and hid in the bedroom. (laughs) When he came out, it was gone. So here's another thing that we know the military is watching. Every damn thing we do. He was burning weeds in the yard a little more than a year ago, and it was it was sending black smoke. And it was the time of the year when fire people are not in their fire watch towers. So how would anybody in a million acres see this little grass burning weeds? But the military knew about it, and they sent an enormous black hawk without any markings came out of the portal and hovered right above my sweetheart. Just hovered there watching him. Exactly two hours later, which is how long it takes to get from the nearest forest station that's in charge of that part of the forest. Exactly two hours later, um, a ranger came up to the fence, obviously to see what we were burning. He stepped out of his truck. But by this time, the fire is gone. He started to approach the fence. But when Sweetheart walked toward him, he ran back to the truck and left quickly. He has heard Sweetheart's reputation to fire weapons at trespassers. The military knows everything we do up there. So we know we're being watched. I know when they're tapping our phone conversations. And if they're doing that, they're also listening to us on the land. And if I'm speaking on the phone to a friend about these matters, they will tap and interfere. And I finally started yelling at them. And a young Marine black ops told me to yell at them, tell them that I know they're there and I know who they are. And so when I do that, they kind of back off or they slow down, but they, they still make, they still do this. 
And the same young Marine Black Ops told me that one of the reasons why we don't see the chimeras in the daytime as often is because they're let out of the base through the portals at night to go grab elk and deer and anything else they can eat. And then when it's time to bring them back, they they have a chip implanted in the brain. And the chip signals them come home. So anyway, I need to back up. In 1989, my ex-husband, who is a manufacturer and does has multi-million dollar contracts with the Department of Defense, came to me one day and, and he said, every time I go to Texas, I'm not as productive as I need to be because he says I'm constantly getting on and off planes. I'll go to Austin. He says, then I have to rent a car. Then I have to go check into a hotel. He says, and the day is shot. And then I go see as many clients as I can. Then I have to check out a hotel, go catch another plane to Houston. And he says, that's just not, that's not functioning. And we had just bought a new SUV. So he suggested that we rent a travel trailer and spend an entire month so that we could see all of his clients and also do some cold calls on some new ones. And I said, okay. So we packed up my two indoor kitties and off we went. But on the way to Texas from California, which is where we lived at the time, he said, I need to stop in Carlsbad, New Mexico to see one of my Department of Defense contracts. So it's okay, big deal. So we go to the military base and he shows his security clearance. Otherwise, it would not have let us in where we went. And he's driving and driving. And it's like, we're getting farther away from everything. There's, there's nothing out here. It's military base, but it's empty. And then pretty soon there's this little shack out there in the middle of the nowhere with a small parking lot. And he pulls up there. And I asked him, how long are you going to be gone? He says, oh, maybe an hour. I said, well, it's May. I'm not sitting out here in this hot sun for an hour. I'm going to go inside where it's air conditioned. He says, okay. At this time, I was 44 years old and probably could have passed for 36. And um, at that time, <laughs> no longer now, but at that time, I turned heads wherever I went. And so the man that he was working with thought I was pretty hot stuff, and he just wanted me to be where he could watch me all the time. So he said, you want to go down with me? Well, it's a tiny little building. I figured down means basement. So I told him, I said, I can't do anything because I don't have a security clearance. And he looks around and in a soft tone of voice says, if I hang this badge on you, you have a security clearance. Come with us. Oh, well, what can I see? An office building? So we got in an elevator and it kept going and kept going and kept going and kept going. And I'm thinking, wow, how deep is you know, nobody's got a basement that deep. Come to find out we were 28 stories down and we were on the first level of a tunnel system. The minute those doors opened, I knew I'm someplace I should not be. I'm going to see things I should not see. This could cost me my life. And basically what it was is this enormous cavern that was carved out of salt. It was hard to believe that there was that much salt that far below the surface, but there was. And I could also see that there were enormous tunnels going off in several different directions. This was massive. How many more layers were there? So just out of fear, I kept my eyes down. But out of my peripheral vision, I could see men coming and going in hazmat suits. I thought to myself, oh, my God, what have they been exposed to? Which tunnel did they come out of? What did they do when they were in those side tunnels? It was being really, really creepy. So we ended up standing in front of a lead box that was probably about two inches thick and about the size of a kitchen table, maybe a small kitchen table. So we're standing there next to this lead box and the lid has no hinges on it it just it fits and it's leaning against the side and there's a rubber seal and come to find out my husband at the time was manufacturing that rubber seal for all of these lead boxes and so they were talking business and I was trying very hard not to listen because what you do not know will not kill you so 
finally they were winding up and this guy had been trying several times to get my attention. He was really making a fuss over me. So finally he asked me, do you have any questions? And I asked him, what are these lead boxes for? And he smiled very proudly and very unashamedly and says, we take spent nuclear rods from power plants and submarines and other military devices, and they're still radioactive and dangerous. We put them in these lead boxes, and then we cover them with salt. And he spanned the room, and I looked, and there were huge mounds of salt all over the room where they'd already buried many of these. And you can imagine my response to that. So I asked him, and just how long does it take for the salt to eat away and rust the lead box, allowing all of this radiation to escape into the mountain? And he laughed at me and said, about 20,000 years, but what do you care? You and your grandchildren won't be here. So at any rate, since that, you know, for many years, I put that memory behind me. It was one of those scary things you don't want to remember. I put it away from me for several years. And then a few years ago, I discovered a map of all of these underground military bases. And Carlsbad, New Mexico was listed. And it shows all of the different bases it connects to, like um, like Fort Bliss and El Paso and Roswell and Alamogordo and Los Alamos and God only knows everywhere outside of the state, but it's listed as closed. That means it's full of radiation. So um, that's, that's one of those. And then also during the last year that I was married, my ex-husband was a bragger and if his brags, if his bragging mood came up, it came up. During the last year we were married, he couldn't stand it anymore. And he had to tell me something that he wasn't supposed to tell me. And that was that he manufactures rubber seal that goes on the tunnel digging devices. Now, these devices can carve a tunnel 30 feet across or bigger. And they'll go a few feet at a time. They'll pull back. And with military lasers, they vaporize the dirt and the rock because they can't take it upstairs and tell people what this is. So they vaporize it just like if they were going in with a dust broom. They vaporize everything that they have cut away. And then they push the machine in and it cuts a few more feet. So he told me he had been in one underneath Lancaster, California, because he needed to talk to the engineers about this particular seal he was making. So I do have firsthand experience and firsthand knowledge that these things are real. Um, wow. So anyway, as if that's not bad enough, I was talking to my friend in uh, Prince George, British Columbia, Canada, about two days ago. And she was asking, when are you going to do this interview? And I told her, and she said, Carrie. And she was badly shaken. She said, Mike and I were grocery shopping this week. And she said, I looked up just in time to see two men coming down the aisle with one of those ISIS super giants. And she says, do you remember a few years ago when we saw photos of Christian men in orange jumpsuits with their hands tied behind their backs, marched along a beach, and then made to kneel, and then the ISIS Soldiers behind them executed them, and some of those soldiers were just, they weren't even human. They were too tall to be humans. And I said, oh, I remember that very, very well. And she said, well, these guys came down the aisle, and they had one of them with him, full beard, very, very Arabic. And she said, he went by Mike and her with the other two men. And in her mind, she is thinking to herself, he's got to be one of those ISIS super soldiers that's not a human, even though he looks like a human. And a mosque was just recently built in uh, St. George, 
And as you know, the Canadian government is bringing those people in by the millions. And she knew immediately what he was. Now, these things look human, but they're not human. And they are, the soul that's in them isn't a human soul, it's a demon. And they can smell human beings. You can't hide from them. They can smell us. And they can sense when you're paying too much attention to them. He whirled around, came back, and stood face to face with her, gazing down at her. And she is just under six feet tall. And she said he literally towered over her. He had to be more than seven feet tall. And she said he wasn't just big like a guy that works out in a gymnasium. She said he was massive muscles, not humanoid at all. And I asked her, what was the expression on his face? And she says, that was what was so scary. There was no human expression on his face. Just looking down at me with those evil, dark eyes and staring at me, she says, it terrified me. So that reminded me that in the last few months, I have seen news clips of one of the leaders of Syria. It, it's, it's, not, it's not Assad, but it's one of his top authorities. And on two occasions, I saw him in a United Nations meeting screaming in rage that not only is the CIA in America making these humanoid super soldiers, but they are making some of them with Arabic DNA so that they fit in with the Arab people and that these CIA manufactured humanoid super soldiers are mixed in with ISIS, and he was screaming this accusation in the United Nations against the USA, and I've seen enough to know it's true. It's true. I saw a film of one of them kill a human being, sit on him, cut him open, take his liver out, eat it, and laugh. So, is there anything that you want to ask or comment? Yeah, I have lots of questions. I mean, this is one of the most fascinating stories I've ever heard. And it's uh, it's something that has a little bit of everything in it. And it kind of can if you if you take your story and you start connecting dots with a lot of content that I cover on my show, but this, my show is conspiracy, paranormal, uh, cryptozoology, like Bigfoot, Dogman, things like that. You have a little bit of everything in this this story that you just shared with us. And I, I would guess I would like to start out by asking you, um, do you ever wonder why you were even allowed to purchase the property you purchased that put you in that situation? Uh, well, it's no big deal. Um, the man who sold it had had it for 20 years. He had bought it from some hippies who had bought it before. And um, they built a tiny little pit in the back of the property, thinking that they would have a hidden house when they were there. Well, they came back one summer after the monsoons, and it was full of water. So it's like, oh, this isn't what we want. So they sold it to Roy. And Roy, Roy is a, civil, a retired civil engineer. And he, has, uh, he and Sweetheart have a mutual friend in the nearby village that is also um, ex-military. He was a super soldier. And he says there are things that are starting to come back to his memory that horrifies him. They trained him to be a super soldier. That's another story. Anyway, uh, basically what a super soldier is, if it's not the humanoid that they create, a super soldier is a real human being born of parents, and they take them out of the six-year-old, and they turn them into a Jason Bourne. And their identity goes away, and they become a puppet. So all of the Jason Bourne movies are real. That is real. They have it perfected. Uh, remind me to tell you about Dr. Nick Begich and something he did to me that backs this up. Um, so anyway, uh, these two engineers got together and they designed this barn that would be built where the land was cleared. Huge barn. And uh, so he built that barn, but he never got the doors on it. 
And so Roy would go up there with his fifth wheel in the summertime. He put in a well and he put in a septic tank. And then he would, in the summer times, he would take his RV up there and just chill. And so he did that for 20 years. And then finally he, he started getting, he, he had neuropathy and he couldn't feel the pedals on his vehicle. He knew how fast he was going by the sound of the engine. Uh, he shouldn't be driving either, especially not on those roads with a big old fifth wheel behind you. But at any rate, he decided he better get rid of the property and, and go somewhere else. He ended up in Deming, New Mexico. So anyway, we uh, Sweetheart had built a small home for him in the years past, and they were friends. They had a lot in common. And one day we were in a little local cafe, and we sat down in the booth next to Roy, and Sweetheart just kind of leaned backwards over the booth and asked, what are you doing? What's going on? He says, well, you know that property that I have? And he said, yes. He had seen it 20 years before. It's like, I got to have that property. I want to die on that property. At any rate, um, he said, I got it on the market for $100,000. And, of course, that was like, to Sweetheart, that was like, are you kidding? Is that all you want? So he said, Carrie, I have to show you this. You're not going to believe this. You're going to want to live on this property for the rest of your life and die on it. So we went up and looked at it, sure enough. So anyway, we came back and uh, we told him, yes, we want it. We, uh, and in fact, he was, he was speaking with Roy and telling him, yes, yes, we want it and everything. And I was, I was keeping my mouth shut. And finally, the Holy Spirit said to me, You can't make him hold it if you can't come up with the money right now. So make him sign a contract with you, not with Sweetheart, that he will not sell it for any price to anybody else that you have first right. And when you get your court settlement, you'll pay him. So I stepped out of the car and I said, Roy, Sweetheart and I love it so much that we want to live there for the rest of our lives and die on that land. And he completely turned away from sweetheart, turned on me, eyes big, face lit up, and he said, if you love it that much, I'll give it to you for 80. And I tried to tell him, no, I'm not here to bargain. I'll I'll give you the 100,000 as soon as my court settlement comes. He says, no, it's 80. So I told him, I said, I said, I have to have a contract because Sweetheart can't get to his house sold that quickly. It's not even on the market. And I'm still waiting for the court to let go of the money. So please come into the house and sign a contract with me. So Roy came in and signed a contract with me, first right of purchase for $80,000. And nobody else could come and outbid me. And the funny part of it is the whole village went into an uproar after that. Oh, my God, everybody wanted that property. So anyway, uh, that's how we got it. Um, And so uh, my court settlement came. And actually, Sweetheart started, it took two, two weeks for him to mend the fences that the wild cattle had torn down. And then there were other things to do and what have you. So he was already up there. And so anyway, we eventually got what we needed to pay for and then to pay for the building materials and everything. But sometimes when we are in the forest, we'll have, tr- we'll have to pull over and stop to let somebody else to go by. And they'll always stop, roll down their window and be real friendly and chat. And they'll they'll ask, like, are you here hunting deer, too? Or are you here for the elk season? And, and Sweetheart will always say, no, I'm going home. I live here. And and people from both sides of the border are just blown away. Men who are in their 60s will tell us how they hunted in that area as children. And their fathers told them that they had hunted there with their fathers as children. We go back three, four, sometimes five generations. and And all these people, like, you got that property, boy, heaven opened up and gave it to you. And we do feel that way because for what is coming, it's going to be the safest place in the world to be, military or no military. And we already know that the Holy Spirit is upon us, that the chimeras cannot cross the fence and the black-eyed children have not returned. And their spying on us is somewhat limited. Uh, It's just that at my age, it's not possible for me to live there. 
so we commute, commute back and forth. But it is it is a godsend. Wow. So you say you commute back and forth, uh, and you mentioned about not you didn't say a di- you didn't attack it directly, but uh, your sweetheart is he no longer with us, or was there a separation, or what? Oh. No, no, no. He's alive and well. That's why we commute. I, I go to him, and he comes to me, and we talk on the phone every day. Okay, so uh, you guys are just commuting back and forth, and so it, it sometimes is a little bit of a long distance relationship. Yeah. Okay, I understand now. I just wanted to clarify that. A very permanent relationship. Just the the logistics of living there, especially in the winter. I have fallen down the stairs a couple of times. You don't want to fall down the stairs when you live there. Because if you have to, somebody's going to have to go up to the top of the mountain to use a cell phone. They will not send a helicopter unless an ambulance has already been there. The ambulance can't get in. So, you know, if you can get a helicopter in there, it's got to come from Albuquerque or Phoenix or Tucson or someplace. There you go, 300 grand. So there are, there are difficulties in being an older woman there. I can understand that. And I, I respect that. Uh, so some of the things that you talked about, I want to kind of talk about a little bit here. You know, one, the upright walking wolf and the white gorilla. Uh, now, my audience is very familiar with the idea of Bigfoot and uh, what people call dog man. And they're seen all over the country. And I live in Pennsylvania, yeah. and Pennsylvania and Ohio are very well known for this white Bigfoot that runs around. And, you know, people who don't believe in such things, they would say, how could that ever even blend in to be unnoticed? But from what you're saying, these things are part of, you know, some kind of governmental um, experiment or some kind of process, and they're let out and then they go back. So that would kind of explain why these things are remaining so undetected. And in Pennsylvania, there is rumored to be a deep underground military base. And I know earlier you had said in every state there, they're there. And so is that- There is more than one in Pennsylvania. Really? Do you, do you have any idea mm-hmm. roughly where the locations are? Off the top of my head, no, but I do know that I have seen a map of all of them and how they all connect to each other as well as underneath the ocean. In fact, they've made mermaids. They, um, they're, like a, they're very much like an unusually large human, and at the waist, they're a fish, huge scaled fish. And uh, for some reason or another, quite a few of them washed up on a shoreline in Great Britain and some children. Uh, were there with one. One of them was still alive and it terrified him. Um, It's possible that their sonar that they use, you know, sometimes it causes um, whales and dolphins to beach themselves because they're trying to get away from the sonar. It breaks their eardrums and it's, it's very tragic. And that's probably why they were on the beach, but they do have, they have bases underground and portals and everything. So, and they have uh, they have chips in them that will program them to come back. Oh, here's something else I almost forgot. Um, gosh, it was before I moved to Utah, and I was still uh, still had the house. It still hadn't been sold. So at any rate, um, he came home. It was summertime, and he said, "Now this is when he would have as many as eight bull elks." on the property wallowing in rut season and huge herds of females as well. And then deer all over the place. Okay. So he came home one day and he said, from the time I left the property to the time I hit the pavement, which is 13 miles. And it takes about 40 minutes to go that 14 miles, 13 miles. He said, I was overcome by the smell of decomp. I said, you're kidding me. He says, no. I mean, not like you drive by a dead animal and then you're gone. He says, the entire forest is overwhelmed with the smell of rotting flesh. And it's like, oh, my God. They let a whole bunch of chimeras out and they killed. Mass killing. So he was home for about three days, 
And when he got back to the property, he got up on the, uh, just before he left the top of the mountain to go down into the valley where it is, he said, that smell is still strong all these days later. And then after that point, it was like, where are the deer? Where are the elk? There are no animals in the forest. And there have been rare sightings of deer and elk since that period of time more than three years ago. They just literally, and the, uh, that plus on another occasion, it would have been very early in the year, immediately after a deer hunt season, he saw a caravan of big refrigerator trucks pulling huge trailers with ATVs, just literally a caravan. And when you have a huge refrigerator truck with a long trailer full of ATVs, some of those hairpin turns are going to be really sketchy. And why would refrigerator trucks be in the forest? What they were was they were the military. They came up and they use brilliant lights, which is against the law, because when you shine brilliant lights on a herd of deer or a herd of elk, they freeze. They stare at the light and they freeze. And you can literally pick them off like ducks at the carnival. So they were obviously getting good quality meat without hormones or vitamins or pesticides or anything else. And putting it in the refrigerator trucks and taking it down to the portals because they're storing food for when they bring hell on earth to us. All of the elites will be in those tunnels and they'll be eating like royalty while everybody up here is dying. So you feel that at some point they're going to be releasing these things onto the surface as almost like a permanent thing. And it's just going to be wreaking havoc everywhere. Yes. There is a scripture, I believe it's the ninth chapter of Revelation, that speaks about the end of days, and it describes things that people speculate what they're, what they're trying to talk about. And I did that myself for many years until I learned what, what in the world we're dealing with and living with and seeing on a daily basis. Now I realize this is what uh, the ninth chapter, I believe it's the ninth chapter of Revelation is talking about, says that. Men will be so fearful that they will pee and poop themselves and their knees will knock together and they will want to commit suicide. So the reason why I wanted to do this interview is that people from all over the world are going to hear this interview. Some of them are going to think that woman's nuts. That woman is bat poop crazy, you know, but no. I, I, I'm coming from some real solid information and experience. And the thing of it is, if people know what's coming, they can emotionally start preparing themselves. Oh, yes, I heard the woman talk about those. I heard the woman speak about that. Oh, yes, I know that our government is the bad guy, too. Uh, they'll start be, and then hopefully the listeners will start getting uh, on the internet and they will start researching. I want people to research everything they can about super soldiers, whether it is real children that are taken from their homes by the CIA and they get a Jane, uh, 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 Jason Bourne gun to them, or they actually create a humanoid that is possessed by a demon and is enormous. I've seen pictures of U.S. troops, a long line of Humvees and troop carriers, and the super soldiers, the human, uh, humanoids, they're not humans, the humanoids walking beside them because they're too big to get in the vehicle. Wow. Where did you see this stuff? Uh, every now and then they come up. Now, one of the things that I want people to look up is Project Mon Talk, and that's M as in Mother, O, N as in November, T as in Thomas, A U L K, Project Mon Talk. And it's how they take these children from their parents. And basically, what they do, they take them at about the age of six when they're sweet, innocent little boys and sometimes girls, and they torture them. 
one of the super soldiers who can no longer be used because they broke him so badly has now regained some of his memories, not all of them, but some of them. And he gave more than an hour testimony of what they did to him to make him the way he was. Uh, but recently, he's been scrubbed from the Internet. He, he uh, He's hard to find now. But he said they would strap him into a chair with arms on it and spread his and, and tape his hands down and spray his fingers. And then they would put electrodes underneath needles underneath his fingernails and torture him. And they would sexually torture his genitalia. And what they what they're doing is they traumatize these children so horrifically, sexually, physically, emotionally, that they create another personality. And when they're being tortured, they escape into the other personality so that they don't have to experience the torture. And eventually, they forget who they were. And they are now this new creation. Now, I want people to look for Dr. Nick, as in Nicholas, N-I-C-K, Begich, B as in boy, E, G as in George, I, C like cat, H. He has a PhD into the life of me. I can't remember what field of study he is, but he has a PhD. And he is at www.earthpulse, all lowercase letters, E-A-R-T-H-P-U-L-S-E dot com. He has written a book, and, and, and it was written, gosh, more than 25 years ago. Angels do not play this harp, and harp is spelled all capital letters H A A R P is in petroleum. He has another one that's called Mind Control, and Mind Control teaches how they make Jason Bournes and other things similar to that. And harp is how they bend the ionosphere, and when it pops back, they have it aimed. They can make uh, earthquake six miles deep. They can make a volcano explode. They can cause an earthquake that causes a tidal wave, and that's what they did in Japan. They created that catastrophe in Japan. They created uh, Katrina. They created the floods two summers ago. Uh, all of this. You got to read those books. This guy is so far ahead of everything. It is just absolutely unbelievable. So anyway, I think in about 2000 or so, I knew that he was going to be in Santa Fe. So I rushed my little sweet bippy up there because I wanted to see him. I wanted to buy everything he had. So he was doing a presentation and a lot of people just refused. This was like 20 years ago. So a lot of people just were scoffing at him. Democrats and Republicans both were there in the audience and they were scoffing at him. They just thought this is too far out. This is too far out. But I already knew it. So anyway, he asked for a volunteer and I volunteered and he asked me to hold out my hand and spread my thumb back as far as I could. And he had a small device in his hand about the size of a cell phone with a tiny little wire coming out of it and a stainless steel probe about the size of a ballpoint pen and maybe two inches long. And he said, I'm going to put this stainless steel thing on the tip of the, uh, it, it, on the web between your finger and your thumb. I'm going to put it there. And I want you to tell me what you experience. And I guarantee you'll be shocked. You won't know what you're going to experience. So I thought, okay. He says, I promise this won't hurt. It'll just be a little bit cold because it's winter time and the steel is cold. So he touched me and I stood there astonished thinking about it. And he said, you're experiencing something, aren't you? And I said, boy, am I ever. And he said, would you like to tell my audience what you're experiencing? And I said, yes. Someone is sitting at a piano and they're playing a Mozart concerto. And I know that it's not in this room and it's not coming into my ears. It's inside my brain, bypassing my eardrums. It's just in my brain. And he said, that's how it's done. And he said, now mind you, this was 20 years ago. He said, they have the ability to point at a single individual at a ball game or it lined up for a parade anywhere where there's a large crowd. They have the ability to point a beam at someone's head and instantly that person is a zombie. 
They don't know who they are. They don't know anything. But they know that they have to go to a certain place and kill a certain person. When the deed is over with, they will have no memory of it whatsoever. But just in case they might remember it later, just in case, they'll be assassinated. And that's how a lot of assassinations are done. And I began to think the other day, you know, how can the Clintons (laughs) do away with so many witnesses and nobody's ever caught? Well, guess what? (laughs) It's that little funny beam in the head. You know, I, I actually have uh, some stories about um, that couple that I can't even feel comfortable sharing on the show because uh, I've known about it for years before I even started the show. And it's too, I, I feel like it's too risky for me to talk about because I don't want to cross yeah. up anybody. And so I just keep yeah. it to myself. Yep. Uh, in the position that you are in, yeah, but you want to know something, if they're going to kill me, they would have done it by now. And if they do, they do. Well, I'm only 33 years old and I got a two-year-old son and I, <laughs> I got a lot of life I'm trying to get through. <laughs> is there anything else you want to ask or comment on? Yeah. I mean, boy, is there. So you were talking about the Black Eyed Kids and how you found out that they were involved in the, the mutilation and you said to remind you to come back to that if you didn't get to it. I don't think you did. Uh, if you could go into how you found out that they were involved with the mutilations that you guys were finding. And also, uh, how did you find out that the Black Eyed Kids were making the scratching sound? Uh, because there's quite a bit of it on the internet now. But I learned about it a long time ago. This goes back 20 or more years in the area of Dulce. There was an enormous Native American reservation there. Um, And they were having all those kinds of problems. And first of all, most of these military bases will be near a Native American reservation because so, not all, but so many of those tribes were involved in witchcraft. And so it's a spiritual connection. But anyway, when you come up with Dulce and the animal mutilations, you also come up with the BEKs. And then it seems that recently the BEKs have been spotted in broad daylight and they're being seen in other places. Now, here's what happens. If you actually look in the face of one of those, they have shark eyes. There's no white around the pupil. It's just those black malevolent eyes. And if they look you straight eye to eye, everybody, male, female, doesn't matter how brave you are. The effect is terrify, run. But because they are demons, they can slip away from you just like, well, they were walking down the street. Now they're not there. But everybody's encounters with them, they say they'll never forget the terror. The, the malevolence is so severe. And you will find them all around um, Certain tribes of Native Americans, not all of them, Uh, the Native Americans themselves, there are five tribes that the Native Americans themselves call the civilized people and the other ones are not included. And I won't go in here because every man, regardless of who he is, has the opportunity for salvation and life everlasting. So I won't name names, but most of them were always involved in demonic worship of some kind or another, and that's why they are there together. And another thing that I would like people to look for is there is a very famous ranch on the eastern side of Utah where UFOs, chimeras, and everything else were there. And um, one man had a ranch there, and they just they were destroying everything. It was awful, awful, the, uh, the skinwalkers. Awful thing awful things. And finally, he was losing everything he had. And finally, a government agency came in and bought the ranch and uses it for research. But one of the things that people can look for um, on YouTube is the uh, Native American skinwalkers. Now, these are very, very dangerous. Um, What happens is a human can transform himself. It'll be the medicine man or someone like that can transform himself or herself into an animal. And for instance, one young man who was not Native American but lived 
on the reservation. I think he was a government worker. Uh, there was a, a dog, a skinny, skinny, skinny dog that came around and it appeared to have rabies. And he was afraid it would hurt his animals and his children. And so he killed it. I think he hit it with a board. I might be confusing him with another person, but he, but he killed the animal. And uh, then he went to get a shell or something. He it. When he came back, the dead animal was not there. And he immediately became critically, critically ill. And it was necessary to take him to the Native Americans to save his life. And apparently, if you kill one of these skinwalkers, they put off some kind of a, a, not an aerosol, but a dust or something, and you inhale it, and it'll kill you. It'll kill you, and there's nothing anybody can do. It's like the Native American medicine man has to reverse that curse and remove that from you. So you, you, people will want to look up the uh, Navajo Nation skinwalkers and learn about that. And then when you see that, you'll probably see another link that will lead you to the ranch in Utah where they had the skinwalkers, the UFOs, the chimeras, and everything else, and eventually had to sell it to the government. But there's a lot of that stuff all over the state of Utah. Yeah, that's Skinwalker Ranch, right? Yes, you know of it, Skinwalker yeah. Ranch. Yes, I, I I think Skinwalker Ranch is something that uh, I have looked into, but there are so many stories about Skinwalker Ranch, and I've come across a lot of stories that seemed like they were almost written by somebody else that I have a hard time sometimes making sense as to what was actually going on and what was fabricated or retold by somebody that maybe added some details, whether it was on purpose or not. But Skinwalker Ranch is the definitely one, a fascinating story. The the one that I I got it was a it was YouTube and it was rather lengthy. It was told by the rancher. I'm almost positive it was told by the rancher. And I know it sounds freaky, but you better believe it because if you don't believe it, you're going to have a problem. Yeah, yeah. I there's definitely something that went on there, and there it probably continues to. But um, you know, you were, you were talking about Project Montauk and. You know, Project Montauk is, uh, if anybody's listening, it's actually an area on Long Island in New York. And it's where they yeah. had these experiments going on with people back, what was it, back in the 50s or 60s? At least that's what they want to tell us because it was a real project and they, they have admitted that it was real. I think it was Bill Clinton back when he was president actually came out and, and, you know, issued an apology for do our government doing these things. Now, do you believe, and this is a question for you, do you believe that this is still going on to this day at Montauk or Absolutely. elsewhere? Absolutely. It's still going on today. And many of those people are in political office. Oh, the people that were actually, uh, uh, you know, messed around with there. Yeah. They, they're prepared. They were specifically groomed to run for political office. Some of them were specifically groomed to be soldiers. Like our friend uh, in New Mexico has told some hair-raising stories to Sweetheart. Um, it was after the movie came out, Air America, was it maybe, about the, the people that, I guess they were U.S. soldiers, I'm not sure. Anyway, he said seeing that movie triggered memories he didn't know he had. And he has a memory of being somewhere is like, I was there. I don't remember being there. How did I get there? And he has the memory of having the hair, the crosshairs of his scope on someone's head. And then the memory is so ugly, he doesn't want to go back to it. He says, I know, I just know that if I had his head in my crosshairs, I'd probably pull the trigger, but I don't want to think that I did because there was something else attached to it. But seeing that movie triggered some memories. And this can happen. And in the Jason Bourne movie, it happens. That's when they decide they will kill you. There is another one who is probably in his late 60s. He's an elderly gentleman now. And he says sometimes he will go someplace and a total stranger will come up to him and say, I know who you are. And he'll say, I'm sorry, we've never met before. And they'll say, you're the sniper from the Vietnam War 
You are America's greatest sniper. You had more kills. And he says, I have no memory of being in Vietnam, let alone being a sniper. But there are too many military people who know him. And another one of those super soldiers tells similar stories, very similar stories, that people recognize him. And they know he was one of them. Yeah. And, you know, a funny thing is with these super soldiers, uh, I saw a video years ago and, you know, every time you see something online, there's always the uh, people who say it's not real, people who want to believe it. And it's really left up to you to decide what you want to believe. But there was a video of our military at at some kind of uh, station and they weren't on base. They were out somewhere and they were patrolling. And there was this giant, giant man that was patrolling with them and he was standing there and you saw other soldiers standing next to him and literally they were literally about half this man's size and height and he was massively wide he looked like a nephilim yes a lot of them are nephilim you know the bible very clearly says and after the flood there were nephilim and I remember I'm, I'm a real history buff and I have a photographic memory. So if I learn a piece of history, boy, it's stuck. It doesn't go anywhere. And I remember that in the 8th century, Roman soldiers were still battling Nephilim. And I remember some of the explicit stories about them. Now, there is another one that is still on YouTube, but I want people to look at it. It's called, I Kill the Evil. The government does not want you to know about. And it's a young man who is in Afghanistan, and he's given a little bit of information at a time. And each time he has an encounter, he's given a little bit more. And basically, they're killing the Nephilim in Afghanistan that eat people. They have six fingers, six toes, uh, two rows of teeth, bright red hair. They smell like a combination of a septic tank and God only knows, and rotting flesh and God only knows what else. And the Afghan people are very aware of these things. And and children are told, don't you go out at night. Um, And this this, uh, YouTube is more than an hour long. And he eventually gets to, this is why I want people to listen. These Nephilims are still alive and well. And the military packs them up and flies them to an underground military base in Ohio. Some of them are still alive and some of them are not. But I want them to look up. I kill the evil the government does not want you to know about. And in the end... After this guy has encountered and killed with his troops, some of these Nephilim had them shipped back to the U.S. At the end of the tape, he is taken to an underground tunnel underneath the Euphrates River where the dam is. And the underground tunnel is connected to some caves that are... Gosh only knows how ancient, because they're underneath the Euphrates River. In those caves are 30-foot-tall fallen angels chained, just like the Bible says. Those angels are chained beneath the Euphrates River. And he tells about that experience. Have you ever heard of the man named Henry Groover? Yes. He tells a story of how he was translated with other people to a location. I believe he said, uh, I forget the location, what it was, but he... I think they were in Italy. Yeah, that's what it was. And and he actually walked into, what, for lack of better words, a, a dungeon. He walked down into an old staircase dungeon where he came across these fallen angels. And uh, he tells his story of you know what happened. And I find it very fascinating and how it all came back full circle with how he confirmed that this actually happened uh, is absolutely amazing. Yes. Have you ever heard of William Cooper? Uh, yes, I have. I have his book. His book 
contains Xerox copies of actual government documents. So if anybody out there is listening to me and you think I'm bat poop crazy, darling, get William Cooper's book. He was assassinated near my home for writing that book. He's ex-government, and he tells it all. He has documentation after documentation after documentation of the things that I have been speaking about. Yes. And he was murdered for pushing that book. But at any rate, here's something that's very important. In the back of that book is the Protocols of Science, spelled with an S. Now, 90% of the people on this earth who call themselves Jews are not Jews. Revelation 2.9 and Revelation 3.9 both speak of the Jews in the synagogue who are not Jews, and they are the synagogue of Satan, and those are the words of God. Okay, this goes back to the Khazarians. They're Edomites. They're the, they're the children of uh, Esau. And they eventually came from Turkey across Russia. And when they were in Russia, they were barbarian nomads. They literally picked the fleas and lives off, lice off themselves and each other and ate them. They never bathed. They were barbarians. They murdered more than a million people on the Russian continent. And that's the reason why. And I recently met a young man from Russia. And he says, you know what? We go back in our history a thousand years and there's no history. We don't know anything about our country after that. Well, it's because of the Khazarians. Okay. The Khazarians, this would have been um, uh, in the years 1800s, the ninth century. Islam had been around for two centuries. And they would fight with Islam and then they'd be friends. And then they'd fight with Islam and then they'd be friends. But anyway, they made a decision they were going to either accept Islam, Christianity, or the Jewish faith. For whatever reason, they choose, chose the Jewish faith. So they passed themselves off to the world as Jews, but they're not. And they were extremely wicked. They eventually invaded Europe and then the Americas and so on and so forth. Okay, let's go back to um, the 1770s. There is a German family named Bauer, B-A-U-E-R. They were Satan worshipers. They decided to rename their family. In the Hebrew language, Roth, R-O-T-H, means the head of or the leader or the authority. It can be a school teacher. It can be your parent. It can be the guy that owns the bus company downstairs. You know, whatever. It just It's a position. Roth means a position. Well, they worshipped Satan, so they considered themselves Satan's children, so they made the name Rothschild. In 1776, when our nation was signing the Declaration of Independence, they were creating the Illuminati and the Protocols of Sion, presenting themselves as Jews, controlling politics, controlling banking, controlling everything in the world. And they, in so doing, are so wicked, they've made the world hate Jews. The problem is, the Jews you hate aren't Jews. They're the fake Jews, and they're called the Khazarians. They even run Israel. So anyway, um, in the back of William Cooper's book is the English version of that German document. Um, and so anybody who wants to know the 24 protocols, just read them. 22 of them have come to pass. There's only two of them left, and that is the revelation of whom the Antichrist is. Uh, Barnes & Noble sells that book, and I highly recommend it. William Cooper, um, the rider of the pale horse. Behold a pale horse. Yeah, Behold the Pale Horse. It's a blue paperback full of documentation for the things that I have said. So if anybody doesn't believe me, go buy that book. Yes. And he will literally rubber stamp everything that I've spoken today. Yes, William Cooper uh, is, you know, somebody who uh, did a lot of work in this field. And that book, Behold a Pale Horse, is definitely a must read for somebody who's wanting to look into this kind of stuff more. Uh, I wanted to also bring up before I forget that you mentioned about the YouTube video that's called I Kill I killed evil that the government does not want you to know about. Uh, if people are having yeah. a hard time finding it, it I believe it's the channel that's called Dead Man Talks Forest of Fear. And uh, it's a whole long video that people can check out. And uh, I, I'll be checking it out myself. But I wanted to ask you a little bit about this portal situation you were describing earlier. Uh, and that is 
One, I wanted to know, is this portal uh, something that, because, I mean, you described how these entities, these chimeras come through and they're allowed to come through this portal and that's how they get back. And this portal that, you know, your husband saw a helicopter disappear into, is this portal something like you would picture in a a sci-fi movie where you actually see like a round circle and something goes through it? Or is it just literally you don't see anything and all of a sudden it just disappears into it? They're camouflaged doors. They're physical. For instance, um, not too far from this property where the land is very high altitude, but it's very flat, like a top, like a tabletop. Uh, there is a man that I know who uh, is in his 80s and he walks. Oh, my goodness, does this man walk. And there is an area near Highway 60 in New Mexico that uh, there are a lot of nature trails out there. And you can, I mean, you can see for miles and miles and miles because it's all low scrub brush. And he was out there walking on a dedicated trail. And out of nowhere, this soldier in full ninja gear comes up and points a weapon on him and threatens to kill him. And it's like, where did he come from? And he tells the guy, you have to leave. And, ah, Dwayne, uh, Wayne, his name's Wayne. Wayne kind of argues the point, and the guy finally makes it clear you have to leave. I'm going to shoot you right here, or you're going to leave. So Wayne, grumbling, fussing like a grumpy old man, turns around and walks. He doesn't walk three or four steps, and he turns around, the guy's gone. But there just happens to be a bush on the ground. So they have all kinds of doorways and traps. Um, they know, uh, they can tell by a seismic machine if a fox is running around or if a deer went running through or if it's a bipedal. Uh, they know when you're there. And I'm going to go back to 1995 when my ex-husband and I were moving. Uh, we had made a plan to retire at this remote location nearby. Um, we were still living in California, but we had a nice four by four SUV, so we, we would come four times a year and visit the land that we bought. So we were in this um, adjacent national forest, and um, we were in a section where the trees were not that tall, and you could see the, the dirt road winding around the mountain for quite a distance. And if you drove even slowly, you made huge clouds of dust. And so we came in, we hadn't seen anybody. We came in and I parked the SUV and we took a little hike across the field. It was covered with beautiful flowers. And we got across the field and we turned around to come back and lo and behold, there are these SUVs, big Suburbans with totally blacked out windows and a whole bunch of military people in in full regalia with weapons. They were in front of my vehicle and behind my vehicle. I forget if there were three or four of them. And these guys were watching us with the ox. And I said very softly to my husband, they're going to kill us. Just, just walk like you don't, don't pay me any attention, like nothing's out of the ordinary. And don't say anything wrong. And so... And I kept thinking to myself, how did that many vehicles get there without raising dust? So anyway, I deliberately kept my eyes to the ground, mostly because I didn't want to break my neck on stones or fall into a cactus. And I got about halfway across the field and I looked up and all those soldiers and all those SUVs were gone and not a cloud of dust. So I must have parked next to one of their doors that was disguised by trees and bushes. So when you say this is a physical thing, there's a physical doorway, it's it's literally a physical doorway that just is very well camouflaged that you just would never see it. You won't see it. In fact, um, there was a YouTube that some hikers made in Colorado where they kept seeing this huge, huge black spot in a cliff up at the ridge of these really, really high mountains, probably 12,000 feet, whatever. And they just thought that it was a shadow. But every day they noticed that, well, that he finally noticed that one day the shadow's not there, but the sun's in the same position. So he started taking photos on a time release 
and he saw this enormous, like the doors just opened up, and a flying object came in, and the doors closed. But they were in the side of a cliff, so they just looked like a stone wall. I got you. So, so this is like camouflaged almost it's like nature like it's like a rock wall and it looks just like a rock wall but then it will open up and allow things in and out and i i used to have a friend that would come over to my house and deliver firewood for me and he said on a number of occasions when he was either hunting or cutting firewood he would look up and there would be these soldiers and they would be threatening to kill him. What are you doing here? And he would say, I'm fishing, I'm hunting, I'm, I'm cutting wood, whatever. He had numerous encounters with them and they always threatened to kill him and he would beg for his life and, and they'd say, okay. And they would walk a distance into the forest and then they were gone, literally gone. He'd run into the forest and it's like, they couldn't have disappeared that fast. So there are trap doors everywhere. Well, that explains a lot then, because when you first said portal, I was thinking along the lines of, you know, some kind of like quantum physics kind of thing. Uh, no, there are, there are those kinds of portals. Yes, because uh, the BEKs go through that kind of a portal. I'm speaking of a physical trap door that you wouldn't recognize. So do you think that the portals that the BEKs go through are the same type of portals that, you know, the chimeras go through? I think they go through both. And there there was a man, I think his last name is Schultz. He was executed for making a video. But he had at one time, he was an engineer, and at one time had worked at the military underground base in Dulce, New Mexico. And apparently that one is seven layers deep. And he says that the Dracos live on the seventh tunnel down. And nobody is allowed down there but the Dracos. And then there are levels where our administration offices, there are levels where the military lives, there's levels where the military equipment is stored and stuff, but there are seven levels. And he describes a gunfight that took place between some FBI agents and um, I think they were Dracos, but they were unusually tall. And they would point their finger and it was like a laser that would just, the guy's just not there anymore. That guy died. That guy died after writing everything there is about uh, Dulce. And on the one trip that my husband took me to to Los Alamos, they offered to take me someplace. And by this time, I'd already had the Carlsbad Cavern experience. And I, no, I wouldn't let them take me anywhere because I was afraid that if I saw something, they would later say, you know what, she shouldn't see that. She didn't have clearance, and you know. At that time, I was very young. I had a lot of life to live. And so uh, Los Alamos is a bad place. Oh, and I also had a friend who, who she is deceased. She's Cherokee, but for some reason or another, she was raised on a non-Cherokee reservation in northern New Mexico. And she told me about the Illuminati. They make human sacrifices every year. And she said, in the vicinity of Paos, In some really deep forests, there is a very, very long, narrow runway that accepts private jets from all over the world. She said, unless you're in an airplane flying over it, you won't see it. But none of the commercial airlines are allowed to fly in that space. And she said, every year the Illuminati comes in with their human sacrifices and they have their meeting there. How does she find that out? She's a Native American. She lived on the reservation. Wow. That's incredible. So... Let me ask you a question here about your husband uh, when he was sick and he, he was in the hospital and the nurses looked in the pan and they were horrified. Did you ever find out exactly what they were looking at that scared them so bad? It was parasites. So it was they like, told us it was parasites. Okay. So it was more along the lines of, you know, the fact that, they, that you were right. It was parasites that freaked them out so much. Yes. They, they could see the parasites. And then the fact that the kind of parasite, because if he had gotten it from the barn, they would have been able to identify it. This comes from rodents. This comes from bats. And I would have had it too. Um, And it couldn't have come from his food because I prepared all of the food and we both ate the same food. 
So it was, they said that the hospital record says that they treated him for parasites, but when it comes to the type of the parasite, instead of saying unknown or unidentifiable, there's nothing there. It's simply been removed by the military. And even the VA doctors couldn't get that information. It was gone. So we know that someday when he was on a hike, his vehicle was there on the property, but the gate was locked. They knew, oh, he's just not here. He's out hiking because they were watching him. Then the trailer was open. They just went into the refrigerator and gave him a dose of some foreign, you know, that's, that's biological warfare. Do you know why they were trying to kill him? I think they felt threatened. Nobody who had loaned the land since before the turn of the century had been. In fact, I think the original owners of the land that it was named after were cattle ranchers. They never built a dwelling anywhere near there. So they must have just owned the land where maybe they came in and had pens where they did their branding and calving and whatever, because they had removed all of the trees. It's just this wide spot in the middle of the, uh, of the forest. So. Nobody had ever lived there, and so there was no reason to bother anybody. However, Roy had been camping up there every summer, and Roy did not disclose to us what was going on. Roy had been a civil, he was a civil engineer, and he worked on contract for the military, and he had figured out what was going on down there. And after we figured out what it was and we confronted him, why didn't you tell us about that? He just kind of avoided it. He was very evasive about it, but he did say, I'm going to tell you one thing, do not go outside at night. And he wouldn't tell us why. He just said, do not go outside at night. Wow. So when, so when we bought the property and started building and establishing residence there, that was a new thing for them. Yeah. And I'm sure it probably didn't help much that your husband did have the high clearances that he did have. So it's like somebody... My, no, 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 no. My previous husband had those high clearances. Oh, okay. I have not been with him for a long time. I got you. Makes sense now. So uh, yeah, I think this has been a very fascinating conversation, a very fascinating story that you just shared with us. And I think it gives a lot of people food for thought and some things to look into if they want to try to understand this world a little bit more clearly. Uh, there's times that, you know, we are fed information from a young child through the history books and where our minds are shaped and molded into a certain direction of thinking. And it's stories like this that present a whole new uh, path to think on and what is real and what is possible and what's reality. And I think you just did that today, Carrie, and I really, really am appreciative of that. And I want to say thank you very much for coming on the show. Oh, you are so very welcome. And I do hope that the listeners will rather than challenge me, that they will check it out. Is what this woman saying true? And then I hope that if they realize that what I'm speaking of is um, valid, that they will prepare themselves for what is coming and draw close to the Father and the Son. That's, that's the whole reason for talking about this, because if you don't know it's coming, there will be people committing suicide out of fear. I don't want anybody to perish before they have come into the arms of the Father and the Son. Well, that's the show, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy it, please share the show with your friends, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, TikTok, email. I don't care how you share it. Just share, share, share the show if you enjoy it, because that is the best thing you can do to help support the show. And a reminder, we are doing the memberships on the website. So if you want more of the confessionals every week, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com and sign up to become a member today. And until next week, friends, stay safe, take care. And remember, the truth will set you free but first it will piss you off. Bye.